No, because it's... Hmm. Oops, the numbers go up. Welcome everybody, if you're just joining us, I'm just waiting for a few moments for everyone to join. We're up to 42. Um, great, I think that's everybody joined that's uh, planning to for now. So welcome everybody to this uh, PFLA virtual farm tour. Um, great to have a good many of you with us today from uh, up and down the UK and Ireland as well. And uh, we've got a slightly new format for us to experiment with today, which is a virtual farm tour, as opposed to our usual annual study tour, which we would be doing around this time of year, where we would visit two or three farms in a given area, uh, of a group of about 30 of us to uh, see some certified and non-certified farms and learn more about the grazing management practices that are taking place uh, and that usually involves in an overnight stay as well an opportunity for a group of members to to socialize but obviously we haven't been able to do that this year um, but we've responded to try and come up with some alternative ways in which we can still learn about uh, pasture management and, and share knowledge between members in the pfla and very grateful to our two hosts today uh, lynn at lynn brett croft up in the Cairngorms in Scotland and Andy Hi. Rumming in uh, Wiltshire at Waterhay Farm. So we'll be handing over though to them uh, shortly um, but I just wanted to to welcome you all again and to uh, mention a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers uh, as we go and you can ask questions in the little Q&A function which exists on Zoom and you should see that at the bottom of the screen or if you hover your mouse over the uh, picture at the moment, you should see a little Q&A uh, button. You can uh, click on that and you can enter any questions either as we go or, or when we get to the Q&A time. And you will also see at the bottom highlighted there's a little chat button as well. Um, but please don't put any questions in the chat function, just use that chat function for um, any technical issues that might, you might be having or if there's anything uh, you want to quickly comment on. And we've also got Laura Elliott here in the background who's very kindly helping to host the meeting and keep an eye on all the, the technology from the background. Um, we can't see you, uh, your cameras should be turned off. Um, just, to, just to let you know, I did have one PFLA member contact me last week to check that we hadn't seen him nod off um, during the Q&A session at the end. So don't worry about that, although I'm sure you won't be nodding off um, in today's very interesting uh, virtual farm tour. And um, we are in some ways pushing the boundaries of what, what the technology can do, but it's very exciting that we can make uh, a virtual farm tour accessible to so many more members than we might have ordinarily made the study tour accessible to. So please do bear with us uh, with the technology and uh, I'm sure it'll, it'll work well in any case. So we're going to be visiting uh, two farms. Uh, we're going to start with Andy and then be moving on up to Lynn in, in the Highlands. And after each farm visit, we will have a little bit of time just for some specific Q&A specific to that farm. So we'll have 15, 20 minutes or so with each farm, some Q&A uh, with each farmer. And then at the very end, we'll, have a, we'll open up to a bigger Q&A for everybody for, for both of the hosts. And the idea behind that really is to try and make this as interactive as possible, have some good discussion going, which we would normally have on the study tour to really drill down into some of the topics and share knowledge between the group that are attending a study tour uh, and not just relying on the hosts for all of their knowledge. Uh, so we'll just see, see how it goes. Um, so I really thought perhaps to imagine ourselves um, driving over to Wiltshire now in a, in a hot sunny day and um, arriving at the farm and finding somewhere to park and getting our wellies on maybe and starting to gather with some uh, tea and biscuits no doubt laid on by Andy and, and sort of imagine ourselves in the space ready to listen to what Andy's got to share. So 
without further ado, we'll hand over to Andy, uh, who will take us through uh, his farming operation. And I hope you've all received today the uh, pre-information we circulated just with a little fact sheet on both of the farms to give you some background so that Andy can really hit the ground running with uh, telling us more about what he's doing. So Andy, over to you. Okay, um, welcome everybody. And uh, very nice to have so many people with us. Um, I hope you can uh, see, can you see what I'm sharing at the moment? Yep. 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 So, um, excellent. So it doesn't actually show me what I'm sharing. So I have to remember what I'm sharing. So it should be a field of cows. So um, yeah, so Water Farm uh, is in North Wiltshire, quite close to the um, Gloucestershire border. So we're about between Symesister and Swindon. And um, it's all permanent pasture. Uh, and as I said in my uh, little sort of intro that I sent round, um, it's about 75 hectares. So we're part of, um, so there's, there's, there's two farms within DW Rumming and Sun, and uh, we're about eight miles apart. And it's, we've got my uncle and aunt live in the farmhouse here. I live in uh, Bungalow and my mum, dad and brother live just down the road, um, which uh, is also uh, sort of cattle based, but with a few other things going on. So it's, um, so we've got, you know, two generations and I've got kids, so it's three generations all together at the moment. Um, and um, yeah, lots of six partners in the business. My brother came in last year. Uh, both me and my brother have got other jobs as well. So we're part time on the farm. Um, so yeah, lots of things going on, uh, lots of opportunities, but lots of challenges, like I'm sure many of your businesses really. Um, at the core of it has always been cattle. So both farms were small dairy farms. And then in the nineties, um, sort of with the onset of quotas, uh, the dairy herd here disappeared really quickly. Um, at Park Farm, it went on until I went to university, but we had quite a discussion about sort of future of dairying with uh, I think we had about 80 cattle um, and so that was packed up in the sort of late 90s so like lots of dairy farmers people moved on to um, suckler cows it was the kind of natural reaction and um, and that's what both uh, farms did so one business two farms both had two suckler herds so a spring and a uh, summer uh, and both kept their own young stock. So there was four calving periods across the business. Um, lots of things going on. So I came back in 2012 and um, I did a thing called the Challenge of Rural Leadership, which I know that Russ has done and some others. And um, it was a brilliant course. And basically it's sort of renowned for people going on it. It's a two weeks intensive course. And then people kind of giving up their jobs or doing radical things. And so, I came back from that and thought, right, I need to just bite the bullet. I need to get on and move back home. Um, there's no perfect time. Let's just do it. So um, my wife said no because she was pregnant, um, and which is quite reasonable. So we had my son, or she had my son in the February, and then we moved to the farm in the July. And so I still worked full time at that moment for the RPA in DEFRA. And anyway, uh, we I've went part time and here this is sort of you know where we are so the the kind of real strength of our business is um so have you got a different cow on the screen now mm -hmm. yep yep excellent right um so is yeah we grow we grow grass so uh, it's sort of heavy clay um and it, you know in normal years we grow grass really really well and so I was I thought, you know, this is, this is, we need to make more of this. Um, I was also quite interested in wildlife and bird watching and realized that it was really, it's really interesting farm. There's loads going on uh, wildlife wise. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to, knew that whatever farming I did, I wanted more wildlife. I wanted wildlife to be involved. I also quite like people. Um, and I was kind of appalled that our, 100% grass-fed cattle were being sold as heavy stores, at, you know, sometimes 700 quid, and they were getting towards 30 months old 
and you know this is a waste so my brother started a, or me and my brother started a free range turkey business when i still lived in exeter and i used to come up to help him slaughter and so he'd already established that um you know direct marketing uh was was working for him and so he uh i thought well let's try and do that with the beef so um i went on the progressive beef group with ahdb which kind of was really interesting showed you lots of different aspects of the beef industry or in britain um went on some pasture for life things well russ hassled me to join through twitter which was kind of the best thing i ever did and then started direct selling beef uh, but also really kind of really got into the fact that um i guess the holistic management side of it that actually you can knit all these things together and you can layer enterprises um and so there's still loads of things i'm still on a huge learning curve and i guess we've been doing this about four years um but yeah it's definitely a i think it's a more interesting business than it was um the direct sales you know you realize so much more of the animal's value um and the kind of mob grazing rotational grazing that's really exciting and yeah and it's yielding more wildlife which is great and there's loads more opportunities that sign kind of have sort of come our way in terms of doing events uh diversifications all within a cattle theme so um it's all good so i'm going to try and show you a little video um so i tried to take some videos these were actually taken yesterday um sorry, sorry about the wind noise what i'll do i'll turn this down so well, it's all crossbred cattle um so we've got quite a lot of herefords uh types um we've got belgian blue cross frisian one at the front here which came from our next door neighbors organic herds quite a few years ago and then we've basically retained our own followers by using the hereford bull so we switched to stabilizer bull um about three years ago because i knew that we needed to we you know we grow really good grass loads of grass and so we can have actually a bit of a, a better cow if i'm honest we don't need something that survives on the top of a mountain um and ah so this, sorry, this is my electric fencing gear so um if i pause it oh, sorry just having mouse problems here we go right um so we can have a we can afford to have a slightly um yeah we can have a a, a better cow so we've started using the stabilizer bull to try and get better mothers so mothers that were uh needed less molly coddling that had a smaller frame um and that would produce uh yeah be really a really good material trait super fertile and so that's what we've been doing and we've been retaining we bought in a few uh heifers of stabilizer heifers they weren't a great success but breeding up using a stabilizer bull has been. So um, that's what we're doing. And yeah, fertility has improved, but that's not just down to the breeding, that's also down to the mob grazing. And also I think to, uh, we've been paying a lot of attention to blood testing and uh, bolusing. So anyway, so this is uh, the bunch that I look after and these carve in July and um, August. Uh, and at the moment, um, so they're not going into very tall grass. This, in my book, this is this is not really where I'd want to be. But we're using Kiwi Tech um, mobile uh, electric fencing. So this year, I've put in a lot of uh, homeschooling. It's been great because I've got the kids putting in these semi-permanent fences. Um, so they've got a hyper spring in, uh, which means they're really springy. And they've got these little gadgets on the end, so you can open the ends and let the cows through, but the middle doesn't drop. And if anything challenges the fence, they kind of bounce back and you can you can drive over them, actually, if you put like skis on the front of your quad. We haven't got a quad, but I'm going to make my bike so I can drive over them. Um, and um, yeah, so trying to get infrastructure, I think, is really important. If you're going to graze properly and you're not going to spend too much time moving fences, having some infrastructure is good. So I really love the sort of Kiwi Tech semi-permanent and I also like the, uh, the cross stuff. That orange thing is a little homemade plate meter, um, which just sort of tells me the height of the grass, which I only use when I think something's not right, if I'm honest. Um, normally it should be off the top of the plate meter and basically doesn't work, but at the moment the plate meter works, which for me is not great. 
Um, so yeah, that just shows a little thong around a fence post go into this little handle. Um, but yeah, so at the moment there, this is a, how much should I get in? I'm probably getting about an acre a day. And there is um, 40 cattle in there. Uh, and they are averaging 640 kilos. So we weigh them all at weaning. We weaned them two weeks ago. Um, and so I'm very interested to know what percentage of the body weight the mother has weaned. So these lot are not performing as well as the others. Uh, they're doing about an average about 36%. But we've got ones in here that are doing 50%, 51%. But if they wean any less than 30%, um, I'm afraid the days are numbered. So we spend more time, I spend more time looking at the performance of the bottom really than the top. Um, and we carve it to, we don't keep anything round if it's empty. So I think we're, we're trying to exert quite a lot of selection pressure because we want animals that look after themselves and that thrive on a grass-based system and that are relatively small. Um, do stop me if I'm waffling, uh, Russ. Uh, uh, other right. yeah, okay. Um, other pictures. So uh, I just wanted to show you. Um, right. So a third of our farm floods, and when it floods, it sort of really does flood. Um, so this is a picture of. Uh, come on. Right. So. Um, it's one of my field signs, uh, which I have these on my field gates with a little leaflet dispenser. And sometimes the cows are even leaning over the fence advertising themselves. So they attract the people to come and look at it. They take a leaflet. Um, it's great. It, they work really well. Um, so this, yeah, this shows one of the fields partly flooded. Um, it can, this year has been, or last autumn was really severe flooding so they started flooding at the end of September and some fields were underwater until March and we've paid big time for that so on the floodplain this year um, we have got a lot of docks um, and a lot of bare ground which is uh, which is not good at all really but you just have to kind of roll with the punches and sort of suck it up so this is my uh, this is one of our floodplain meadows. Um, this is actually really normally very species rich. Um, it's where we have all our fertilities. So normally there would have been about 500 snakes and fertilities in flower. We had one in flower this year. Um, a lot of silt dropped and it's, yeah, it's not looking great. Um, and I'd lined up to do some seed harvesting for a seed company off it this year. But um, there we are. You just have to accept these things. Um, so yeah, farming on the floodplain is, um, you know, I've, I've been a bit negative there, uh, but it can be, so when it looks, you know, when it all goes well, uh, this is what we see. So, you know, sort of purple in snakes and fertilities. Um, but yeah, you've just got to be adaptable, not get upset when you don't get that um, and kind of move on. Uh, now, the let me just find what I was looking for. Oh yeah, so the the river the River Thames flows through the middle of the farm. That's what it looked like yesterday. Uh, it's dropped a lot, so the water levels will be can be even over these fence posts that you can see in the background there. They were this winter, um, which makes for great canoeing opportunities in the winter. Me and my brother go canoeing uh, over other people's farms on the floods. Um, Go exploring that's quite good and um, we also get a huge number of um, winter birds so we get uh, a lot of waders a lot of ducks um, and you get you know hectares and hectares of standing water which actually is a real uh, massive boon for uh, visiting birds um, not only to roost but to feed and so that's really good and so we tried to kind of lever the wildlife side and we have uh, so you haven't this year but in other years, we've had um, dawn chorus walks, and uh, these have gone really well. So we do a dawn chorus walk. You get you turn up at 5 a.m. and you get a sort of two and a half hour walk, um, 
Uh, this guy here is uh, one of our friends and he's a um, ecologist with the local water park trust and um, he kind of leads the walk and then we've got another guy who's the county bird recorder and both of them will work for kind of stakes so um, they kind of help with the ID and um, yeah people have a nice time and then you get fried breakfast to finish um, so normally my brother Chris runs back sort of about halfway through the walk to get the frying pans on and when when it's when we get to the end of walk everyone enjoys that and it's all you're done and dusted by nine o'clock in the morning so we did quite a few of those last year and they were massively successful and we were planning on doing more this year and putting the prices up a bit um but obviously that wasn't to be so um yeah it's just nice connecting with people and potentially these are all beef customers um and we've got quite a lot of serious bird watchers now who are beef customers um which is great um which is really good so that's going yeah so that's that's a really good thing um i'll just say a little bit about our direct marketing uh let me find the picture i was after um but yeah okay i'll just speak about this one so we also do um quite a lot of uh uh things well sort of radio interviews and things like that so we've got some friends who run a local radio station in swindon and uh so that's really good um they're always after content and a lot of it they syndicate onto the bbc so at the moment we're doing a virtual farmer's diary with them and there's lots of opportunities out there to do this um you know all all media outlets they want content and you know, living on a farm with animals and wildlife, like lots of you, there's, there's so many opportunities to do this. Um, they don't all end up in instant sales, but um, it's fun things to do, even if the kids kind of misbehave while you're trying to do it. But um, it kind of, yeah, it's, it all adds, it all makes it interesting. I think it makes it uh, an interesting place to be and an interesting life. Um, so I'll dash on to direct sales uh, right the right so what we do um don't know whether you can see that so uh you have to turn your head around a little bit um so at the moment we're selling two animals a month um we're getting them slaughtered at our slaughterhouse about half well 40 minutes away in stroud and then they're delivered back to us the next week. So we had all these fridges for turkeys. So we've always uh, done our turkeys ourselves. So for two weeks, well, a week, 10 days a year, where we had these fridges um, used and for the rest of the year, they weren't being used. And we had, so we, we converted my father's old milking parlor, uh, filled in the herringbone pit, put some fridges in, in the dairy room, took out the bulk tank, and that's our kind of butchery area. And so we talked to the HO and, she was said, yeah, you can do more. So we actually use those facilities now for the beef. We also use them for my sister-in-law's uh, Oxford Down sheep flock. And that's where I've been this morning, cutting lamb carcasses. Um, and so and we've also got a couple of deer in the free fridge as well. So we're doing, um, going from just doing a few turkeys, we're now do, gonna do 500 turkeys this year. We'll do 24 bodies of beef, about, I think about 30 lambs and um, hopefully a few deer. And this is all really, uh, yeah, it's, it's, the people are out there. We're lucky. We've got an affluent population relatively close. Um, we're not big into mail order at all. We do an odd one or two. And the, the sort of model that we've done, which is based on the turkeys, is that people turn up to the farm to collect and that we try and get all those collections into as small a period of time as possible. So we're not open generally. We have a Saturday morning. We're open for an hour at my brother's farm, an hour and a half here at my farm, and all the transactions, so 80% of the meat is out fresh in that period of time. And it's worked really well up until COVID-19. So what we're doing now is free local deliveries. And um, yeah, that's kind of, that's working. Um, it's, yeah, it's forced us to actually build a website with a shop on. Beforehand, people just emailed me what they want and uh i took card payments on the day now we're doing nearly all of it through the website 
uh, of quite a small number of choices really of boxes about six different choices and then with each of those they can have a variant which is extra mints um, so we like using the pasture for life qr codes and you've got the batch number on there so you can check traceability um, and yes yeah, so the meat sales are going going really well we lost our butcher so he wouldn't come due to covid19 um, he's, he's fairly elderly um, and so I've cut three animals myself, um, so watching YouTube videos, but the last two we did was, um, yeah, sort of, I lost my sense of humour, to be quite honest, doing it, and we were up there till midnight, and it was, yeah, so I've got a new local butcher coming to help us this time, and uh, got some other help with the packing, so it should, should work. So yeah, the direct retailing is not, um, it's not easy, but you know, we're now sort of, uh, you know, the target income from an animal is sort of two and a half thousand pounds, if not a bit more on some of them, um, which is very different from, and then we're selling them now at, well, between 18 months and 23 months, they're going fat. Uh, and that is actually a bit younger than what they were being sold as heavy stores, some of them. So that's the mob grazing and the genetics coming through is all helping that. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're up to. Um, uh, right, uh, just very quickly. So um, there's a few other, uh, let's have a look, things that are sort of on our horizon. So, yes, okay. So we'll just show you these. So we've got a Wix website, um, which seems to work for us. Uh, let's make that bigger. Oh, sorry, it's a bit small. But anyway, you can visit uh, andyrummingsbeef.co.uk. And that's very easy for us to manage. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's fine. Ah, here's some of our silver steaks. So I really like this picture. So look how yellow this fat is. And um, no matter what the experts say, our customers, no one's got a problem with this. And I think that, you know, isn't it amazing that you're you know, just off grass, that your animals can produce this? You know, it's, this is well marbled, this is from Hereford. Um, and that fact almost like glows, like luminous. So um, yeah, why would you throw it into the general supply chain? Um, so we're still putting animals at market at stores. In fact, some went today. But uh, you know, our goal is to put everything, everything through our own supply channels. Um, and I think we can get there. It's just trying to do that in a really organized way that means that we, um, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't lose control and we're focused and it works. So this is a project that um, was meant to start 1st of April. So I'm actually sat inside here at the moment in the back. So, um, so I want to sort of layer up the enterprise, as I said. So we've got the cattle. I want to do some tourism, but I want that tourism to fit in with the farm. So we're going to go for some glamping. And so I bought this lorry on eBay and um, uh, I've converted it to for sort of just for a couple, really. So it's, it's got a bed in the back, little kitchen in the front. This folds down to a patio area and then there'll be a separate uh, shower and um, sort of... Uh, toilet area in another little trailer bought another horse trailer and so we're gonna have this permanently site in the corner of the farm it's meant to open the first of April um, but I wasn't really ready so I've got a bit more time to sort it out so the idea is this will fit in harmoniously with the farm um, as extras they can obviously buy steaks and if this works there's definitely potential to do sort of three or four of these uh, and then the other sort of diversification that I'm looking at really quite seriously but that is quite difficult is if I can find one is let me find a picture is about or is the leather side of things um, and I've been doing some here we go right so I'm interested in taking all my hides into finished leather and so I have I've had some done and I've been making belts just as a hobby really and selling them and uh, if you get it right, there's as much money in the leather as the meat, which is nuts, really, but that's true. Um, but the tannery capacity in Britain 
to provide what I want is is not really there. Um, uh, so I am looking at whether I can build a micro tannery, which is um, pretty challenging actually. You can't just go on the internet, Google it and copy one. Um, the barriers to entry are really high, which actually I see is probably a good thing because once you can do it, you won't get that many people copying you. So anyway, so this is something I'm working on um, and uh, we will see where it leads. But I mean, at the moment we're hearing on the forum that people are being charged for the disposal of their hide, which is, which is just nuts. Um, uh, whereas you take it into belts like that. And as I said, it's worth more than the, all the meat of the whole animal. So um, yeah, so that's what I'm looking at doing at the moment. So should we, uh, should we leave it there a minute? Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you very much, Andy, for a really quick and interesting overview of everything you've got going on, which is uh, incredible, really. And since the time I've known you and you joined the PFLA, it's been amazing to see everything that you've done and, and, and scaled up. And uh, true credit to you and the family, what you've achieved. Um, we've got a couple of quick questions in already, specifically for you, Andy. So I'll just um, fire those out now. We've got one from uh, Craig Barks, who's asking, how do you winter your cattle? Are they housed or outwintered or a mixture of both? Yeah, no, it's a really good point. So we have, so they're, they're housed. Um, and that's tr traditionally, that's always happened, especially around here on heavy clay, everyone brings their cattle in. And in a, in a bad year, you know, people bring their cattle in in September and don't let them out until May. Um, now we've, with the rotation of grazing, we've managed to seriously nibble away at both ends of that. And some years we've had uh, virtually all our cattle out to December and we get them out in April. This year it's 4th of April. So they're housed. We've got um, an old cubicle shed. We've got a old, oldish style 1960s building where we carve a load and then we've got a new building which is quite, quite con controversial when we decided to go ahead with it in the family but we did and that is um, really nice. It's, it's so difficult to justify investing in buildings um, but I think I'm glad we did but what we did we set it up and we put cow power feeders in it in there so it's it's designed for feed and forage we've kind of made our bed on that and it has got a central feed passage where the feed barriers move inwards and as we put block silage in and as the cows eat away at the edges of the blocks the barriers move in they push them in and so there's no wastage it's really clean you don't need to mix a wagon don't need a tractor um it, it's brilliant um i'll see if i can dig out a picture in a minute but so so we, we bring them in Thanks, Andy. Uh, another question from James Allen is, uh, is there a reason you're not organically certified at the moment? Um, would you feel that would give you an increase to the meat value, particularly with direct sales? Right. Um, yeah, that's a good one. So we're not organic certified. Uh, so the only things we do here that isn't organic or that would fail us on organic is that Uncle still spot sprays a few docks. Um, and so, and he always has done but the main issue for us is that we make a lot of hay on North Meadow, which is a National Nature Reserve, an SAC at Cricklade. So it's one of the most heavily monitored sites in the country, but it's not organic. Um, they spots for grey thistles. Um, and it's now become a really important part of our farming system over only over the last two or three years. And I, you know, what we're doing there is, is doing a lot of good work for the meadow and the hay we get back is amazing. Um, well, normally there's not going to be much this year and so we couldn't integrate that with our organic system we also do quite a lot of I do quite a lot of sort of mobile grazing around the parish where when horsey people have got too much grass and I can just turn up with my wheelbarrow stuff and bang cut into their water pipes they don't know about that bit but um and then off we go and they're not organic and so but also I think I'm not quite charging organic prices but we're pretty close so I'd I yeah I it's not it's not on my it's not high up on my list of priorities at all really um, yeah brilliant thanks Andy we have got a few other questions but um, if it's okay with everyone I'm going to leave those until the questions at the end because I want to hand over to Lynn because I think some of those questions will be relevant to Lynn as well um, uh, and hopefully Lynn you're in the field and can hear us okay now 
Can you can you see me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. okay. Imagine, imagine ourselves being a bit cooler up there with you. I saw it yeah. last week. You had some snow, so we did. Yeah, yeah. Well, welcome everybody um, to the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, so we're in the Cairngorms National Park. In fact, if I turn around, you might be able to see the the main Cairngorm um, mountain range behind me. Uh, so our farm, or where I'm standing here at the minute. Uh, it's about 350 metres above sea level uh, and the croft goes down to about 320 metres and it goes up to about 450 metres. So what I wanted to do today uh, is to bring you on a very, very short tour. It's a little bit windy. Um, I've tried to muffle my microphone with a little bit, bit of sheep's wool, which I hope will keep the worst of the wind off. Uh, but whilst we're up here, I just wanted to uh, introduce you to these guys. So. Hopefully you saw in the information um, that I sent around is we run a very kind of diversified setup here. So we're, we're only small uh, Scottish wise, we're, we're 150 acres. Um, now I'm aware that that's kind of bigger than the average farm size in, in England. Uh, but of that 150 acres, about 10% of that uh, would be in by ground and pretty much the rest is either uh, woodland or hill ground. So we really need animals uh, that are going to work well for us up here. Um, and as I say, we've gone for a very kind of diversified setup. So uh, these guys, uh, so this is our uh, Highland Fold. Um, so we started off uh, in 2018 uh, with just three. Uh, we're now up to nine uh, and we just had a, our first little calf uh, who's just lying over there in the corner near mum. Um, we have Highlanders uh, just purely because they are just absolutely perfect for our ground. Uh, they're hardy, they're hairy, and they produce a fantastic beef, uh, all of which we retail locally. And just showing you a little bit of the kit that we have. Uh, so just like Andy, Andy, you've got good taste. We use Kiwi Tech as well. Uh, we use a double strand, and the reason being is because uh, our heifers have horns. Uh, we find that uh, the double strand stops them from reaching under the fence. When we use a single strand, we find that they reach under the fence and then whip it up with their horns. So the double strand uh, helps to mitigate against that. And we also uh, use a Kiwi Tech uh, water trough, uh, which one of our steers is just standing uh, next to. Uh, because again, like Andy, uh, we, we very much follow um, a holistic planned grazing setup here, uh, which in the summertime uh, becomes into a mob. Um, and whilst these guys are outwintered all year round, uh, we only actually started grazing them on Saturday. So the, the grass uh, takes a long time to get going up here, uh, 57 degrees north, uh, everything kind of is working against us. Uh, so we need our team of cattle to be able to turn the roughest stuff uh, into, into beef. So as I walk down through the field, I just want to point you out uh, our uh, hens. Uh, so we have about 100 layers here uh, on the croft. Again, slowly building up. We started with three um, in 2016 uh, and we're now up to, to just in about 100. And about half of them we run in a mobile um, pasture based system. Uh, so we have designed our own egg mobile, uh, you know, kind of pinching ideas from everybody else. Uh, but ours is made of wood because we really need it to be solid up here. Uh, to give you an example, uh, in the winter time, uh, we park this next to a tree so it's protected. Um, but even uh, last week, uh, the ladies have been out in the field since April. And we had gusts on the top of Cairngorm at 120 miles per hour. And there's nothing between us and Cairngorm. So it's incredibly, incredibly windy up here. So we need something that's really solid and that's not going to blow away on us. Um, we just started with the Eggmobile in 2018 and we've noticed a phenomenal uh, impact that the hens have had uh, on the grass growth. So we have a lot of moss and a lot of thatch in the grass because the fields hadn't been grazed for many, many years before we took over Limbrek. And so what the hens do is just hens being hens, uh, they just scratch through the grass, scratch out a lot, a lot, a lot of the moss and a lot of the thatch. Um, so much so that last year this area recovered so well uh, we basically lost track of it. Uh, it completely went away with itself and we ended up having quite a lot of thatch build up over the winter, which was, which was great for the, for the Highlanders, they worked through it. Um, but we find that the scratching that the hens do, um, adding their own natural fertility, 
uh, is really, really beneficial. And our idealized, um, I, you know, I guess, plan whenever we got the hens was that we would run it like a Joel Salatin enterprise or a Richard Parkins enterprise. And we would, you know, follow the, the, the cows with the hens. But the vast majority of our, of our land is like that. Uh, so we only have a, a, a small flat area that we can work the hens. But we still find that they're really useful at uh, scratching through cow pats, spreading that uh, manure and helping them, helping them break, break the, the cow pats down. So as I sort of start to, to descend into one of the lower areas, um, I, I just want to tell you a little bit about our background. Uh, so we, we're completely new to farming, completely new uh, in 2016 when we bought Limbrec. Uh, our backgrounds were in, in sort of conservation and then we worked on a lot of woodland restoration projects in the borders. Um, so all we really knew was uh, nature, um, conservation and, and trying to I guess work with natural processes in, in, in a kind of previous jobs that we had. So I guess that's what gave us our introduction into choosing the way to farm that we do. Um, we always believe that nature is our greatest asset, our land is our greatest asset, uh, our soil health, all our animals, all of those sorts of things. Um, and so therefore, if we look after them, they'll look after our business. Um, and one of the first projects that we took on uh, whenever we came uh, to Limbrek uh, was just in here. So this is uh, an area of hill ground. It's probably about, I don't know, I guess about 35 acres in total. Uh, goes right down to the bottom where there's a, a gully and then right up to the top at about 450 meters above sea level. And, you know, whenever you look at that with a farming head on, um, there's not a huge amount of um, potential in there for uh, turning, uh, turning kind of animals into, into cash product. Um, but we looked at what was happening naturally and there was a lot of natural regeneration. This area hadn't had any grazing in it for about 30 or 40 years, just some, some deer. And so we basically took the guide of nature, uh, is the best way to put it, uh, and decided to plant. Um, so we have planted a broadleaf woodland of 17 and a half thousand trees. Um, and we did that in 2017. And it goes right from the bottom up to the very, very top. Uh, and it's a mixture of broadleaf species such as uh, birch, uh, willow, oak, uh, aspen, hazel, uh, hawthorn, a whole mix of things. And um, what we started to, to, I guess, kind of um, tap into was the fact that not only were we kind of working with a natural process trying to do this, um, we, we live in a really, really, really windy area. Uh, so today it's, it's windy, but it's, it's, it's not windy. It's very, very, very mild. Um, and normally, um, you know, it, it's really difficult to find areas where our animals can shelter. So we started to realize that by planting woodland, uh, that was actually going to probably in the future, in the long term, actually increase the areas where we can have our animals. So at the minute they're excluded, but when that woodland gets up, uh, that will uh, become a really diverse uh, woodland where the animals will be able to browse on the tree leaves, uh, where they'll be able to get shelter in both the winter and the summertime. Um, and it's also taken all the boxes that we wanted to for nature as well. So that was our first big project. Um, and I guess the theme of trees is a very strong theme here. Uh, so with our 150 acres or which is roughly about 60 hectares, about 30 hectares of that has either gone into new woodland or is existing woodland on the croft. And again, that's because we were thinking about long-term planning. So we're thinking about nature, but we're thinking about shelter for the animals. And we're thinking about maximizing uh, the land that we have for the best use that we have. So of existing woodland, uh, it makes up about three hectares. Uh, it's mostly birch. And um, we use that uh, for our pigs in the winter time. And um, we work our pigs through the woodland. And the goal there is to break up this sort of dense tussocky mat of fairly kind of monoculture, thick, coarse grasses, uh, to break that up, um, to add their own manure, and then to create uh, some little patches of bare soil uh, for tree seeds to set, uh, for things in the relic seed bank to have an opportunity to come up. Um, and that's all part of the story that we then tell to our customers. Um, so we sell all of our pork as we do our beef uh, to 100% local market. 
and we sell it in two ways. Uh, we sell it via uh, mixed meat boxes, seasonal meat boxes, whenever they're available. And we also sell it through a subscription-based club. So again, like Andy, um, I don't mean to be your twin here, Andy, but we also have a butchery on site. Uh, we do all of the butchery ourselves. Um, just like we weren't farmers, we're not butchers either, uh, but through a, a bit of training and just kind of getting stuck in and giving it a go uh, and working with our environmental health officer, we've now uh, learned how to, to do uh, the butchery of our pork and we do part of our, our, our cows as well. Um, and that's a really, really great asset for us because it's cost saving. Um, and also it, it means that we can do a lot of added value produce. So we do a lot of uh, artisan type um, burgers and sausages. Uh, we do smoked, uh, smoking and curing, uh, and we're hoping to move into air drying as well. So as I've just been chatting about that, uh, I've come to this area here. Um, so I'll just turn the, the camera around to you. So um, back to the theme of trees. Um, we don't cut our own hay here at Limbrek. We just, we just don't really have the, the land to spare because we utilize it all for our grazing. So we do, we do buy in hay. Um, and what we noticed here quite quickly uh, was that um, in this area, it's becoming harder and harder to find a, a hay window uh, for cutting. So either uh, one year we had a drought, believe it or not, we were pretty much five months without any rain. Um, so the, the, hay, uh, the hay was, 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 was very, very limited available. Uh, or it's wet, uh, or it just rains. We cannot get a hay window. Um, you, know, you might get two dry days in a row, but other than that, it's really, really difficult. So we were, again, thinking about long-term resilience. And um, a few years ago, I used to be involved with an organization when I lived down uh, just outside London called the Ancient Tree Forum. And there was a guy there who used to talk about something called tree hay. So that's just a, a curlew. You might see uh, just you get a lot of nesting and breeding curlews on the croft at the minute. Um, so anyway, yeah, so, so he used to talk about tree hay and he used to say that, you know, tree hay was something that was, you know, really widely practiced throughout Europe and throughout Britain um, until fairly recently, until I guess the mechanization and industrialization of agriculture. And he talked particularly about species like things like ash that were, were uh, coppiced regularly for, for tree hay. But, you know, really, you know, a lot of species could, could apply. So we started to, to read up on it um, and, um, and decided to, as a trial, uh, to plant our own tree hay crops. Um, we can't, as I say, we, we don't really have enough capacity to provide our own hay, but we thought, well, we have a lot of this sort of kind of semi-marginal land that it's not really doing much else. Um, we're certainly not losing any kind of high value grazing. Um, so we went to the approach the Woodland Trust and we said, well, we, we have this idea. We don't, we don't really know what we're doing and we don't really know if it's going to work. Um, but we'd like to, to plant these um, tree hay copses. So they agreed to fund it. Um, and what we did was we used um, basically uh, biomass um, measurements. Uh, so we've got about uh, half a meter between each tree. And we've planted, this is, this is a copse here of alder but the majority of our copses are of willow. So they're all species uh, that will grow here uh, quite well. Uh, so wet, generally, um, and we'll put up with a lot of wind. And so we've planted 10 of these. Uh, so the copses are 10 by 10 meters. We've got 10 in this lower field. And the idea is that whenever they grow up, uh, we'll coppice or pollard uh, two every year. So we'll have a five year rotation. And we'll take off the branches. Um, and what we're trialing at the minute is bundling and drying uh, tree, tree hay that we, we, we make on the croft uh, to see about you know, how best to dry, how best to feed it to the animals, uh, what kind of space does it take, what kind of infrastructure do you need for all of that? Because we don't know really is the honest answer. Uh, so we're trialing a lot of that at the minute. Um, and hopefully uh, by the time that stuff gets uh, ready to be harvested, uh, we'll have a, have a better idea of a system. And we'll also have a better idea of how other people can uh, implement this on their farm as well. It's adding into the fact that trees uh, are able to pull up um, a lot of minerals and nutrients that aren't always readily available in grasses. So there's a huge amount that our animals can get from browsing these. 
Um, and, and that's very much what we're wanting to, to look at a little bit more. So I'm just taking you on a little bit further. Uh, as I do, I just wanna point out this area here. So this is what an area, we call it the flats. Uh, it's basically a big bog. Uh, it's not a very boggy bog, um, but it has its moments. Uh, but there's quite a lot of forage out there for our Highland cattle. And that again is another reason why our Highland cattle are absolutely perfect um, for, for the land that we have. Because in the summertime, uh, we throw the cattle out there. Uh, they can survive out there for about a week uh, without much difficulty. And it buys us a week to additional week to rest the paddocks in our field. Uh, so we use it maybe about three to four times a year. And again, it's, it's just a really uh, great space to have, not just for nature, but it is something that we can work into our, our farm business, which is, which is really important to try and maximize um, the amount of land that we have and what we, can, what we can produce on it. And the last uh, animals that I want to um, introduce you to our, are our pigs. So we buy in wieners here. Uh, we use uh, Oxford Sandy and Black pigs and as I say we run them in groups so in the winter time uh, we just run them in, in, in our woodlands and in the summertime um, we're trialing a lot of different things so last year uh, we had the pigs in the fields in fairly small paddocks and we got them to really kind of target the area and then we moved them weekly and so this year what we've decided to do is is not put them in our fields, but to monitor the impact uh, that the pigs have had in there. This year, uh, we've got them in the area that we call our lower field, which is fairly marginal grazing. You can probably hear them. I'm gonna let you see them here. Hey boys. So this is the area that they have. So in total, uh, they have about an acre probably won't be able to hear a word I'm saying so I'll move away from them uh, so they have about an acre and um, we're really keen for them to um, to really kind of get their snouts in to start to turn it over a little bit uh, to really work the ground because what we are seeing in areas where we have worked uh, the pigs is that the growth uh, the grass growth is coming back really strong um, what we want to see within that is increasing diversity um, and we think that these guys are really, um, yeah, they're, they're really great at doing that. So I'm going to head back up to the croft. Um, the one, uh, I guess, team uh, that you've not met are our bees. Uh, so we have five hives of uh, bees here at Limbrek. Um, we got them as pollinators. Uh, so again, trying to think about improving diversity. Uh, that's a kind of key um, invertebrate that we need. Uh, so we started off with two hives. Uh, we now have five. And um, we find that uh, honey is probably one of our most um, sought after products. Uh, everybody wants honey. Um, and we're in an area where we can pretty much say that we're fairly sure that we're totally chemical free within the area that the, the bees are going to be flying in. Um, and we produce uh, blossom, uh, wildflower and tree honey um, in sort of July time. And then about September time, uh, we're onto the heather honey. Uh, and again, that's a really useful, um, uh, yeah, another product for us to be able to sell. Um, and then the last thing that we do, uh, and then I'll stop talking and I'll pass back to Russ, is, uh, so here at Limbrek, um, I guess, yeah, I guess we're really, really passionate about what we do. Uh, but we're really passionate about telling that story and trying to help people to reconnect um, with the food that they eat. That's such, such an important um, motivation for us. And so uh, a big thing that we do as part of our diversification is getting people here, getting people to come here. So we do tours, obviously not when it's a global pandemic, but when it's not a global pandemic, we do tours. So we do uh, public tours monthly, we do private tours, 
this year we were due to um, start our, our new course, um, which is basically um, sort of explaining to people how it is practically you can go about setting up your own small farm business. Um, and uh, we do uh, talks, uh, we do lots and lots of engagement. And we think it's, it's our role um, to do that because nobody can tell the story uh, or help to build those bridges as much as the people that actually are on the ground and, 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 and do it every day. So that's the other aspect of what we do. Uh, so you're lucky you've got a really great day. I mean, I'd love to say it's like this all the time. We all know that it's not, um, but it, sometimes it is. Um, so I'll pass you back to Russ. Thanks so much, Lynn. That's absolutely wonderful. It's a true definition of a virtual farm tour. And yeah. <laughs> and amazed that the technology held out. So you must have 4G yeah. up there. 4G, 4G in the Highlands. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. It's really interesting. Um, we've got a quick question for you already on the, the tree hay. Um, yeah. Have you ever considered sort of making that into silage at all if the weather's not suitable for haymaking? Is there a way you can ensile tree hay at all? Yes, I think there is, um, but I think it's um, I think it's one of the beauties about tree hay is that because you, as long as you can kind of dry it inside, it doesn't really you're not really dictated by the weather uh, for cutting it, so you can cut it, um, and as long as you can bring it inside to dry it, it doesn't really matter. But um, I think I think people like Lindsay Wistons from the Organic Research Centre, she's looked into all sorts of stuff, and I have a feeling she's mentioned making silage from it as well. Yeah, I think so. There's some good resources. Uh, yeah. In the research Centre, we can certainly share those. Um, another quick one for you um, is uh, from Colt Ely. Um, want to know how big the flats were. Oh, yeah. Just pointed out. Uh, the flats are about, about 35 acres. Okay. And what were in the pigs' diets? How much of that is pasture or what else are you feeding them? It's a really good question. Uh, so uh, like Andy, we're not uh, certified organic, uh, but we try and farm to and hopefully exceed organic principles and PFLA principles as well. Um, so our pigs are fed an organic feed, a pellet, um, which we buy in from High Peak, uh, that is their main food. Um, everything else in addition to that is surplus. So they'll graze, they'll graze in the, in the pasture. Uh, we give them surplus, you know, sort of things like veg and stuff that we grow. Um, but their main feed so far um, is the pellet. We are really keen to move towards a grass-based system. So we're looking at uh, silage in the future. Uh, if we can buy in silage, which is a lot more straightforward for us um, as part of our pig diet, but we're just not, I guess we're just not there yet with our own knowledge. Great. I thought it was really wonderful how you've talked about your different groups of animals as, as teams, teams of yeah. animals moving around and doing a, a, providing an ecological function uh, and uh, a farming enterprise, well, a great way of doing it, but there's one suggestion here or question here whether you've considered um, dairying in your enterprise, maybe a dairy cow breed such as a Kerry. There's nothing that we don't consider here. <laughs> We're open to any suggestions. Um, and, and yes, absolutely. I mean, a, a small dairy enterprise, a micro dairy enterprise would be an absolute uh, dream, of course. Um, it just comes down to uh, practicalities, it comes down to cost, um, you know, we've got quite a lot of enterprises as it is, uh, but maybe one day, uh, for sure, um, we, we'd love to, we'd love to do something like that, uh, if, if, you know, if even just for ourselves. Um, but, but going back to the point that you made about, about working in teams, Russ, I guess it's how we, we feel we run our farm business here in that we are all part of a collective team. Uh, we're all trying to uh, achieve similar outcomes, which is, you know, live quality life, uh, produce quality food, have a good impact on the land. And we feel that all of our animals that are here have to play a part in that. So it's not, you know, it, it's a real kind of practical way of looking at it. It's, it's, it's taking it's taking the, the kind of the words of, of Joel Salatin, I guess, and really implementing that. And that is, you know, 
that working with the animalness of the animal you know so you know if we have an area that needs turned over we use pegs if we you know if we want to improve the you know soil health and build organic matter in our fields we use cows you know it's, it's kind of really thinking what do we need or you know what 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 can we what do we need to, to improve the biodiversity here and what what can we get to do it for us for free brilliant uh one more question for you lynn before you get back to the croft um yeah what kind of forage grows on the flats are there heathers or grasses um yeah again a good question so it's a lot of common heather a lot of uh um ling as well out there erica so wet wet heather wet heath heather uh we have uh things like millennia uh so really rough stuff uh we've bog myrtle um just i guess your kind of classic scottish uh scottish veg vegetation really out there brilliant thank you um, Andy, we'll, we'll come back to you now, but just a note to everyone, um, we'll just have some general discussion now, as I said earlier, um, between our two hosts. Um, and by all means, pop some questions into the Q&A function if you haven't already found that, and we'll all work through those. You're also able, as a viewer, to uh, rate the questions that other people have, have asked to sort of bump them up the, uh, the list for asking, um, but otherwise I'll, I'll work through them chronologically. Um, so Andy, we've got a question from uh, Lapo Deep and Rook down in Devon. He's asking, what are your target weight for cows? And also what is your 200 day adjusted weaning weight as a percentage of the cow weight? Right, okay, that's uh, yeah, very good question. Um, so the, in fact, let me try and share my screen with that one. So I've just, um, flashed up a picture of an animal we weaned uh, the other day, which you should be able to see, a black calf, is that right? Yep. Yeah, so that's ear tag 938. So that's, can you see us Excel spreadsheet now? Mm, no. All right, let's see. Uh, okay, not sure how I move that. Anyway, don't worry. So um, basically, uh, they right here we go um so we are recording so as we wean them so first of all we're using soft wean nose tags uh which is worth explaining so can you see the cows with the yellow tags in their noses no okay uh <laughs> all working earlier but okay let me try it again so right, we'll get this, we'll get this, uh, our desktop, right, there we go. Right, can you see it now? Yep. Right, uh, so um, what we're doing is, uh, so I'm deciding on weaning based on grass growth, um, based on uh, how much grass my brother's got. So at the moment we're doing all the breeding here and we've moved to a model now where uh, at weaning they all go over to my brothers and um, down the road and he's got a rotational grazing scheme that they, they go into. So we've, we've basically shifted the farm over the last two years uh, to having just two herds and specialising. So I tried to treat him like a, like a proper customer. Um, so he wants, you know, good animals that are healthy, fit um, and I think weaning is one of the most crucial points in a cow's life and it can it can be it can be horribly horribly stressful so anything you can do to reduce that stress is is you, you've got to try and do it so what we're doing now is putting in these nose flaps uh so we bring them all in put them in they clip in they're very easy to put in um we leave them with the cows for four days no more um, and then we bring everything in and we split them out and take out the flaps. And that day the cows go straight to the brothers and straight back out on grass. So we're not changing um, what they're eating. So they're, they're out of grass. We're not changing the housing, they're outside. So diet and environment is the same. Um, they've had four days with no milk, but they've still had their mother next to them. So the idea is that you're making the minimum number of changes at once and you're making them more palatable 
and we think it works because my brother weighs these uh, monthly and weighed them really quite soon after we weighed them here. And uh, there's basically no checking growth. Um, there's also not much shouting. The cows are still, I think the cows find it harder than the calves, if I'm honest. Um, so we're doing that. And um, in terms of, uh, so the group we've just weaned, um, the average was 34%, okay, which isn't great. Um, so the actual percentage of the body weight weaned, so this is where you weigh the mother on the same day as the calf and you have one as a portion of the other. So the actual, on the day we did it, was 46.4%. Um, but we like to ratchet everything back to 200 days. Now, the only reason I'm doing that is because that's what is considered normal across the cattle industry. I probably shouldn't bother to do that, but I find I do. I mean, I think this is about whether you feel you're, you're part of a wider cattle industry or whether you're doing your own thing. And um, I think I still feel some need to sort of compare myself with others, but I don't know whether that's a good thing. Probably isn't. But what I am interested in is what's happening in the herd. That's far more important. So I've got spreads between, um, so actual percentage of what they weaned on that day between 32 and 65%. So that means that some of your cows, some of our cows are weaning, you know, double what others are weaning in terms of percentage of their body weight. That's a massive range of performance. And so I'm really interested in finding out those cows and trying to find out, you know, why is, why is there a difference? Um, and you know, what does that mean? Is that something I can influence? So the average cow weight came out at 692 of that bunch this year. And so I would like to think that we can get towards 650, perhaps under 650. Um, but yeah, 650 would be good. We don't want anything over 700 or over 800 and we don't really want anything over 750. Um, so that's, that's what's happening there. And um, the spring calving herds is actually performs better. So they were weighing a higher percentage of their body weight. Um, but also depending on the year, so that really dry year we had, which was a uh, year before last. So the cows came in, the herd came in on average 75 kilograms lighter than the year before. So it's quite interesting. Um, and you can use this to kind of decide, you know, what your culling policy is and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, I quite enjoy the data side of it, but it's pointless having it unless you do something with it. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, Lynn, I don't know, is this question anything you've been thinking about with your Highlanders as well in terms of weaning? Or do you tend to keep them together as a single mob? Yeah, we, we tend to keep them uh, together. Um, that, that sort of works best for, for our setup. I mean, we're only small, I guess. We, we're, able to, we're able to do that. What are you aiming for in terms of finishing weights for your butchery for the beef? Um, I suppose if, if I'm honest, we're, we're, I guess we're still learning that really. I mean, we've only, you know, we've only had, uh, I guess, two seasons of, of finishing our Highlanders and sending them off. Um, but again, look at, looking at it from our point of view is that um, we, we'd, we'd have to think very carefully about what we'd, we'd want to be or trying to change because we're we're working with you know the the, the kind of the vegetation that we have here um, we don't you know we don't we don't change that we don't alter it at all we don't sort of plow or reseed or or anything like that you know we're not we're just we're just kind of moving them around and what they have um, so really I guess that's all going to be dictated or dictating the the final weights that we get them to uh what we are thinking about playing around with in the future is, is keeping them longer so so really to to kind of get to to finish a highlander you know the 30 month cut off before you know you you increase your costs on the on the abattoir and butchery side of things um is is what we've worked to so far but we are thinking about taking them on older so uh you know 42 months even longer than that uh, to see what if 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 the weight that they gain will will balance out uh, against the additional costs um, that that we have to kind of pay up front. So, mm. bit of a balancing act then. Yeah, we're learning. A uh, quick question related to this, Andy from Rosemary Kent. Um, do you deduct the calves birth weight when you measure the adjusted two hundred day weight? 
Ah, good question. Um, I haven't been. So the reason I haven't been doing this is because I've been finding it really difficult to weigh carbs. Uh, this is the reality, um, is that, um, so I had a go last winter. I had, um, so not this winter, year before. So I had a set of bathroom scales, um, which, well, actually what I did, I bought a new set for ha for home because my wife quite rightly said that um, once I had used them for my purposes, she didn't want them back. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so a bit of plywood in the loose housing, pick up the calf, stand on the scales, get daughter to look through the gate to look at the figures because you can't, I couldn't see the figures well stood on the scales. Anyway, it was, it wasn't great. Um, all it did show was that the stabilizers are born, uh, yeah, lighter than the Herefords. Um, so yeah, if anyone's got a really safe way of measuring calves, like within 24 hours of them being born, um, without stressing man or beast, uh, I'd love to know about it. But I probably should take that weight off, sorry. I think a sort of industry average to, to assume is something like 45 kilos, isn't it? Am I right in? Right, okay. Well, that's mm -hmm. interesting because the stabilizers were weighing in at high 30s and the Herefords were all over 40. Yeah. Um, so that's, that would be, yeah, that would be sort of in the ballpark. I think that's the sort of ballpark one that's used anyway. Um, right, next question. Further one from Rosemary Kent. Um, Andy, how do you stop your cows getting too fat on good rotational grazing? Uh, so I... So I don't worry about it now, if I'm honest. And I also know that what we're feeding them over the winter is... Uh, it's not rocket fuel at all. And in some years it can be probably, someone would describe it as, uh, yeah, below average quality silage. So over the winter, um, there is a chance that they have to survive on average to poor rations. And so if they come in over fat, that is, gives us a bit of, um, uh, yeah, so they, they've, got, they've got some reserves. Um, now I was a bit worried now it was, I think it was two springs ago or three springs ago, they got really fat, really fast in the spring. And the ones that were carving in the summer were all were, were over fat. We didn't actually seem to have any carving problems, um, which was good. Uh, so I don't worry too much about it. I think you can look at, so we condition score cows, uh, at pregnancy diagnosis and that's I think quite interesting to do so our vet does it as they PD them and they're better at doing it than me and then you get a little graph a little bell curve of where things sit and I think it's again worth watching at the ones at the extreme ends to the fat ones are they always the fat ones and um, so we want a cow that maintains its condition fairly you know doesn't go wildly either way but no it's a good question I, but I don't I was really worried about it and I don't worry about it too much now and I quite like it if they've got reserves to go into winter. Very good and we've had a quick couple of suggestions uh, on weighing calves already um, so pig weigh crate works well uh -huh. or sheep lamb weigh crate. Right so yeah yeah good idea. There you are um, and a slightly related question again from Andy uh, from Robert Howe have you found any commonalities or reasons yet to explain uh, why the cows weaning calves at such a varied percentage down weights within a given season. Is there anything you think might be relating to that so far? Yeah, so the, so the first thing is that the bigger the cow, the harder it is for them to wean a high body weight of calf. So if you're a 800 kilogram cow and we're asking you to wean 50% of your body weight, that means you have to wean 400 kilos, which is it's very, very difficult. Whereas if you weigh uh, 700 kilos, uh, we're only asking you to wean 350 kilos, which is eminently doable. Um, so the weight of your cow to start with. So I'm quite interested in um, weighing our three and look at the weights of our three and four year old. So cows that have just 
they're into their third lactation. So that should be their mature body weight in theory. So the books say. So I think trying to breed and control your mature cow weight helps you with your figure uh, and also potentially because profit is a function of uh, is, is a per hectare thing if that's your limiting uh, thing on your farm which most people is so then potentially you can have more cattle per hectare if they're smaller because your kilograms per hectare are constant so it's not very well explained um, I think also is is making sure those those cattle are fit and healthy and grow really well um, and it's I think it's about how much the cows are portioning to the calf and to themselves and so looking at where that works some of our highest performing cows are like skin and bone and I don't think that's a good thing so again not selecting if they are doing 51 percent but they're looking like a bag of bones that's not probably a, uh, 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 what's the word, a sustainable breeding policy. Um, so, yeah, but definitely taking out the bottom end, that's the way to progress fast, yeah. is taking out yeah. the bottom end. Have you ever measured um, things like butter fat in the milk? Because I know some breeders in the grass-fed systems in the US, they will select their dams based on uh, higher butter fat content because that is what will drive the fast growth of the calves. Right. I haven't, but I have got a refactometer. Um, and so if you get one with the right scale, you can look at milk solids, can't you? Mm. So we don't get into the fun game, even better than weighing calves, is milking a suckler cow on day two. So, I'll, so Russ, you can come and help me do that next winter. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, and a quick comment from, from Robert Howe as well, says that uh, weigh tapes around the chest could be another good way of getting birth okay. weight. Right. Yeah, so I know a few people use um, okay. weight tapes in the PFLA. Um, uh, Lynn, we've got a question for you about the um, organic pig feed from Lupo, who, who mm -hmm. declares he's a nutritionist in this question. Um, okay. Why does the organic yeah. pig feed need to be a pellet? Is there not another way of doing that? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's just uh, it's, it's how we buy the pig feed in, I guess. And it's, it's like a little... Um, if you've never seen one before, I haven't got one here, but it's like a, it's like a little biscuit. Um, and I don't, I don't know why it comes in pellet form. Mm. Sorry. Okay. Somebody else might know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, by all means, if anyone does know, please, please share them on the chat. Absolutely. Um, and, and don't be shy if there's any more questions. Um, we're, we're aiming to finish this at six o'clock. Uh, but if anyone has any more questions, do pop them in. I've got a question, though, um, for, for Lynn in terms of <clears throat> the, the PFLA really has... Um, grown from the south and grown further north and, and farmers have taken the principles of holistic management and, and made it made it work for the PFLA and pasture for life certification. What are your own thoughts in an upland situation how relevant pasture for life certification is where there is a very different climate for the likes of where Andy is farming? It is and, and I think it's a really good question because um, up here you you know we, we are in an upland situation the kind of the vegetation is very much uh you know it, it sort of is what it is it's very much dictated by where we are and there's there's you know there's not a lot that you can do with well i suppose there is but there's not a lot you can do with heather moorland and and that's what a lot of our you know our large far, well our normal sized farms of which we are a very small farm you know that's what you're kind of dealing with so i guess it's much more naturally sitting within a, a, a PFLA certified uh, parameter, I would say. Um, but I don't think that makes it any less relevant uh, for the greater message. So for the greater message as to what PFLA is trying to get across, I think it applies just as much to an upland situation and it's just as important, you know, the certification and the standards to have up here as it would be, you know, maybe down, for example, where Andy is. Um, so I, I'd really, I think we'd all, all of us up here who are, you know, very much kind of a part of this uh, kind of regenerative agriculture movement would love to see uh, more PFLA stuff, more PFLA activities happening. Um, I think it's just, it's just maybe it's a, it's a groundswell, isn't it? It's sort of starting to kind of to move sort of slowly north. And, and, and so that's why it's great to be a part of it today, even though we're, we're just a little teeny tiny part of it. No, it's fantastic. A real, real flagship. And um, for some people who maybe are not aware, the PFLA has been running an Uplands project uh, funded by the Prince 
Texas Countryside Fund, which has been a very interesting learning curve and seeing how the FLA principle can be brought to upland areas, which in some areas tend to be relatively high input uh, uh, livestock sectors um, with, a, with a, a, a big dependence on, on expensive bought in feeds. And that, of course, has an impact on yep. the profitability in the local economy. So the PFLA has been really actively looking at how the principles of, of pasture fed farming can be integrated. And I think, as you've rightly said there, um, there are people now looking at this with fresh eyes and, and making it work. So that's, that's great. <clears throat> um, so um, another question I have, um, whilst there's a few more coming in, the, um, you've both set up a butchery in the last few years, uh, which isn't something perhaps everyone's able to do, but how, how has that been successful? What, have your, what would be your top tips to, for anyone perhaps considering that to get their own local supply chain going? What, what have been the, the key things that you've both overcome to make that possible? Shall I go first on this? Sure. Um, have you got a picture of, of the yep. butchery? Yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, I think, um, firstly, I'd say that, so we started, we did it because uh, we were getting inconsistent um, product back from our current butcher. And we felt that we weren't, in control and the product quality was a bit variable and we had the space because of the turkeys so we were very lucky in that we didn't have to justify building a whole butchery just for at that time i'll get about one animal every six uh, every six weeks or one and a half months but actually once we did it and got involved um it was it's really really interesting uh and having a bit of knowledge about where the meat is uh, people get obsessed with back ends of cows. Well, actually, what's more interesting is over fatness and length. And um, in this picture here, you can see now this was an over, we yeah, had too much fat on it, Hereford heifer. And what, what I learned doing this was that the time it took me about half an hour per brisket to take the fat out of these. Whereas with a stabilizer steer I did before, I think I did the brisket in about 10 minutes and I got 60% extra yield in the stabilizer. Now we know, we know fat's got flavor and this is good fat and all of that, but actually in terms of labor and yield and bottom line, the stabilizer and the stabilizer was ready eight months before the Hereford. The economics is just phenomenally different. And so getting, and I know everyone's kind of different, we've all got different systems, but just understanding where the value is being added, what for you is, is a profitable animal what isn't so getting under the skin of the butchery has been has been really interesting um and what it's it's now changed so we used to put animals that we would get crucified at market through our butchery which were generally slightly over fat hereford heifers but we now are moving away from that because actually the very best steers are economically uh We've got a bigger margin on those in our butchery than over fat heifers. And we, in fact, we just sold a load of Hereford heifers. They weren't fat because the market, in my opinion, overvalues them and undervalues uh, some of the steers. So, and we can only find that out by actually cutting it on our tables, weighing stuff, making a spreadsheet, another spreadsheet, and then acting on that information. So, um, you know, whatever you've got, you'll find animals, the variation. So yes, however you can get involved in the butcher, even that's just stood in your butcher or slaughterhouse having a look, just some kind of feel for what the end product, how it works is, is an immense amount of value. Mm. That's my brother and that's my sister-in-law who, yeah, couldn't really do any of this without them to be honest. Great, thanks Andy. Yeah, and I guess from our point of view, um, so the reason for uh, installing the butchery was, uh, so Andy made a good point there about, um, you know, kind of ensuring, ensuring uh, the quality 
you know, we put so much work into uh, raising the animals well, into making sure they're part of a positive contribution to the land and telling the story. So whenever, you know, whenever they, you know, it came to the product, we wanted it, it to be the, the best that we could make it. Um, and we're very lucky that we have uh, the abattoir that we use is five miles from here. So uh, the animals are able to be brought a very short distance with the kill, and then we collect the, the, the carcass and then bring it back to the croft. So, you know, whenever you're looking at food miles and, and footprint, it's, it's tiny. And again, that's all part of the story. Um, long term, uh, we would be able to save on, on butchery costs. You know, again, we are a very, very small setup. So with our meat uh, side of things, um, you know, that the, the overheads, you know, that we to, to get, you know, into that kind of profit margin, uh, you know, any kind of wins that we can get, any pounds or pennies that we can save, uh, all really, really matters a lot to us. Uh, so, 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 so there was that element um, after the initial uh, investment of the, the butchery. Um, and and then it was the continuity of supply. So um, we we only have uh, seasonal meat boxes whenever we send animals away. We're not able to, to have kind of constant sort of monthly available uh, fresh produce. Uh, so what we decided to do was we, we decided to kind of split our meat sales into two ways. And this is only because we have the butchery that we can do this. So one, we have the seasonal meat boxes fresh um, whenever the, the animals go, we get those out. Um, and then we created something called our Little Mountain Meat Club. And what we do is for all of the animals that we send off, we keep back some of the carcass uh, and we, we sort of freeze it in portions as depending on what we're going to do with it in the future. And then monthly, we turn that into a, you know, a really special uh, treat uh, for our members. So we'll make, uh, you know, really nice kind of uh, artisan Italian type uh, salsicce sausages, or we'll, you know, this month we're doing some smoked, uh, cured and smoked Thailand beef. Uh, we do sort of back bacon with, you know, it coated in, in, in kind of Limbrek honey. You know, we do a whole range of different things. And so people su subscribe and they pay an annual subscription uh, for in, in advance uh, for the year. And then once a month, uh, we create this uh, nice kind of treat and we deliver it to their house. So we have uh, members all around the area within about a 20 mile radius of the croft. And that means that we're able to keep up a continuity of, of monthly meat supply um, because the only other thing that we have regularly to sell are our eggs. Um, so again, without the butchery, we couldn't do that. But it, it is all as well bringing it back into that story. So it's all bringing it back into that, you know, farm to fork. You know, this is where the animal uh, was raised. Uh, it was killed five miles from here, it comes back, it's butchered here, it's by us, we've raised the animal, we butcher the animal, and then we bring the meat to your plate. And so it's really kind of building those connections with people uh, in the community. Brilliant. And it's great what you've both done. And I, I would say it's not necessarily something all PFLA members have to do to get certified and have a supply chain. And there's other good examples. Perhaps we should do some more webinars to feature on that, how to create supply chains through shared butcheries, but it's to credit to you both for what you've managed to do and how that's benefiting your businesses, enabling you to go that bit further. Um, a slightly connected question to this for Andy from Neil Tustian down in uh, Somerset. How does the faster finishing of the stabilizers impact the taste of the meat? And he thought that part of the point of PFLA beef was that the slower finishing gave better taste. Yeah, so it's, it's a good point. So I think um, so I think it's more about maturity and fat cover, but I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert. There's no doubt, doubt about it that a well a super marbled, and we had like a super marbler back in February that was mad, uh, Hereford Heifer, uh, eats amazingly well, tastes great, and that's great. But the yield off it and the economics was, was, was not great at all. Um, and so it's trying to find a happy medium, isn't it? Um, some of the stabilizer steers are, are quite lean, um, but it, it depends. We're, we're still finding our way. I think the, I think the flavor of all of it, in my mind, has been, has been good. Um, and I also think that when you're eating a piece of beef, there's, there's a lot of other cues that affect that flavor. Uh, and so I think the presentation, the story you've been told about it, the experience that when you've been and collected it, I think all those actually do affect when you actually eat it. 
but yeah, it's important to us that it has a reasonable amount of fat. But I don't think, for us personally, I don't think age, I wouldn't say it has to be a certain age. I would say it has to have the right fat cover, cover and maturity. Um, and I think actually that I don't think there should be any, dis if you can grow cattle that fit that capability in 18 months, um, and I don't think that's a problem. And I would also say that, you know, I, I want this farm to be profitable. I want to be able to, so we've got four partners uh, that are that are soon to be aging. They probably wouldn't want to be called aged, but they, you know, we've got, a, the farm's got to support those. Um, we've got two kids that um, got to kind of, if they choose to do further education, it'll cost. So the farm has to work. So for us, I am interested in, in things that are, turn that cash over a bit faster but product quality is really important so I don't want to sacrifice that but I do want to explore um, you know perhaps the edges of where we can get to. Great um, and Ali there's a few requests for pictures of your feeding system and uh, water trough system as well just whilst you're finding those there's another question from Nicola Morris around your cull cows and whether there is anything you've done to um, uh, explore using cow meat yeah. in that direction. I know, having tasted it myself, it's possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we we've done a few cow cows. So we do a lot of. Uh, well, last year we did loads of burgers for local village events, and so we use cow cows for those because um, economically it's it works really well. Uh, and so a well fleshed cow cow with a good fat covering is is was great and also the price of cold cows were dire at that point i think they were like 650 quid and you can make a lot of burgers out of a cold cow um so but you do need fat covering at the moment though cold cows are worth a lot of money we sold one last week at market for a thousand pounds which and, and i don't think mcdonald's have even started burger production yet um i think they're going to start this week um so it's an interesting one, um, but yeah, I would I would like to get to the stage where every animal goes out through our supply chain. So every cold cow, every prime animal. So yeah, we're looking at looking at that. Um, I've got some pictures, and I'll try and do this quickly. Um, Great. Of our so so this is our. Can you see a picture of a? Yep, it's coming. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that's our shed with the cow power, and the cow power is at the sort of to, in the right of the middle. And so if I move to uh, this picture, have you got the cows feeding? No. Okay, I will just reshare with, okay, so make this really quick. There we go, right. Um, so you should have some cows now feeding? Yep. Okay, so you've got four feed barriers and each is independent and they move forward on these parallelograms um and there's like a little rubber mat at the bottom stops any dung getting into it so we put the blocks in um pack them up nice and tight and then so we fill up twice a week and i think we put about 13 15 blocks in at a time you can put them too high if you fancied but it, it works for us and um it's great uh yeah uh but you need good quality silage otherwise you form these little bridges and they won't move in so we use a sort of clamp silage and we use um, a cling film, which is brilliant at uh, not, not, not wasting any silage. So that's great. Very quickly, plastic water, people were asking about water troughs. So all mine, can you see a water trough? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So this is my mobile grazing setup. It's very high tech, it's very cheap. Um, uh, so it is a blue plastic barrel. Now I've got the design or I modified it off a pasture of life thread that's worth looking up on these mobile watering. So it's blue barrel, find your most intensive dairy farm in your local area, make friends with them and then get all the stuff off them. So they have loads of blue barrels that you can get for free. They have IBCs for free, um, loads of stuff that you can repurpose. These are roofing bolts uh, with little rubber seals I put these little bits of angled aluminium on because they were hanging around and they keep it rigid, stop it expanding. Uh, you put your water fitting in there, bore valve, or I use these little Chinese valves off eBay. Uh, I'll put some instructions up on the forum. I, I, I'll put a proper thing. 
two fence stakes to drag it along, get your daughter to plait some uh, 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 bale of twine to make a handle, which is really nice. That's, that's a Gucci element. And um, yes, yeah, so we've got three or four of these and they work. Um, they consistently work. They worked all last season without an issue. And I didn't want to publish any plans until I'd really road tested them. And so I just need to sort of write my slogan on the side of there or on the wheelbarrow, uh, which I think would be like no paddock too small, no meadow too big, and try and get more local uh, landowners to kind of, um, yeah, let's come and graze. And Andy, how many um, cattle can you water off or how many animals can you water off? One of those uh, so yeah, so I've been having, so it was 45 cows with calves off that so again it's looking at your water pressure um and so at the end of the pipe borrow get a measuring jug from the kitchen stopwatch and see how many liters per minute you're getting out of that pipe and that's really important so we average well yeah between i think we're up to about 24 in some places which is fine for that um uh but yeah what you be careful if it's lower than that. And in the middle of the summer, you, I, I keep a really close eye and watch out for any pipe blockages. So if you're dragging pipes around, which I do a lot, just be careful you don't get snails inside them and things. Okay, great. Well, uh, our time's up, I'm afraid, but um, thank you so much to you both for um, giving, sharing so much information in a, in a very interactive way, in fact. And it's been, uh, it's worked amazingly well. I'm, I'm really, amazed and thank you everyone that's been uh, watching from home wherever you are um, near and far so I hope this has been a really effective way to learn more about pasture for life farming and, and just in general the principles that the PFLA advocates and uh, perhaps if there's any particular feedback by all means share that on the um, PFLA forum. This event has just been for PFLA members although some of the webinars we've been running will be more uh, open more widely such as the the pastured pigs webinar that was done last week and they will be recorded as well so if you want to watch this again for any uh, particular feedback on any any of the points made uh, that will be made available to members and there are some more um, PFLA webinars coming up very soon uh, which will be advertised uh, in a newsletter coming out later this week so do keep your eye out for, for that and I hope like me you're really excited about how uh, these webinars can provide us with uh, some really interesting content and, and shared knowledge experiences that we couldn't otherwise get during this lockdown and hopefully that will make us think differently about how we do things when the world does come back to some sort of normal. So um, I can see that somebody's off down the pub now which is great, good for you and uh, thanks for coming in. So I'll wrap things up now and thank you again to Lynn and Andy for a wonderful tour and for everyone being here. So thank you very much and Thank Speak you. Soon. Carry on grazing. Right. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.